I'm about to present to you is a, is a shortened version of a presentation that I gave um, in Switzerland uh, last year. That presentation is available in its full length online uh, as well. So I will leave a link to that in uh, maybe um, in an email or in the documentation later on. Uh, but I thought it was in, important to repeat some of the uh, some of the main messages from that talk here. So here I'm talking in particular about the data corrections that Tim also introduced uh, and how we apply them to the data from the mouse. So uh, where does all that come from? Well, uh, here at BAM we are trying to support uh, uh, scientists from our institute and from other institutes as well. Um, which includes, of course, uh, the participants uh, here and the participants online. Uh, so we try to help you to do your science in the best way possible. Um, BAM also has a mission to support industry, uh, uh, but uh, academia is the second branch of, uh, of support for us. Um, in our group we have the mouse for this, which you saw yesterday, it's a very long machine. And with, uh, with about two, two full-time staff members, we are operating the machine and trying to improve the methodology. As you know, we can move the detector forwards and backwards, uh, so we can move it very close to our sample. We can actually move it up to about five centimeters before the sample, before I get nervous. If you're not careful, you can run your detector through your sample, which uh, will have disastrous effects on your detector um, and um, <coughs> will cause some tears in my eyes. Um, but anyway, five centimeters before your sample you already get a pretty good uh, wide angle scattering pattern. So um, you collect the large Q region of your scattering patterns. Um, so we collect at multiple different multiple distances, uh, very close to our sample, and then further back uh, we collect uh, some more small angle scattering signal. We typically have this um, this data uh, composed out of uh, four or five different measurements. Now, what other people have done is that they've taken the individual measurements and then found, found a scaling factor between them in an overlapping region, uh, but I don't like scaling factors. I don't like anything that, that you can adjust um, because it gives you an additional small tool for modifying your data and that should be avoided at all cost. But with the right data corrections we can actually get all of these data sets at, uh, on the right scale um, without any fudge factors uh, allowing you to get the correct data. So that Q scale at the bottom as Glenn expa explained yesterday can be directly correlated to the dimensions that we're probing so that is uh, shown over here. So on the where we have a large Q, so a Q of 100 inverse nanometers, we're probing objects of uh, 0.6 nanometers, 0.06 nanometers, so sub-angstrom scale. That's really your crystalline dimensions. Um, as you then go to smaller Q, you're, you're probing larger objects, say nanoparticles, in, uh, embedded in, uh, in, a, uh, in a graphite support. These are samples from Zoe, who you, who, whom you've seen yesterday. And at very, very large um, um, sizes and very small Q values, you'll find information on your porous structure as well. So anything with an electron density contrast uh, at the different length scales can be measured. Now you'd like to analyze this, and uh, for most analyses this means that you need to correlate a model with your data. So you need to, do, to, you need to describe your real structure as best you can with a model, uh, so that it can describe your data uh, after adjustment of some parameters. This of course works better if you can bring the model closer to your data and your data closer to reality. Um, that means you need in your model to account for uh, realities such as beam sizes um, and multiple scattering and for the data you need to correct these as much as possible for the imperfections uh, that we have in our data collection. So yeah this is a problematic topic to research because 
if you apply for funding for, for studying data corrections, uh, what you will hear back is that your field is so old, surely data corrections is pretty much a solved issue by now. So let's go back to the library and find out if this is really true. You search for data corrections and you will find, as Tim has shown, a very great variety of, uh, of different types of data corrections, ranging from uh, very simple data corrections where they say, well, your actual intensity is your scattered intensity minus your background, um, to a slightly more, um, uh, slightly more involved background subtraction here, taking care of this displaced volume correction, interestingly. Um, two very, very complicated um, uh, subtraction equations that you can do. Um, many papers don't even mention what they did for data corrections. They just say, well, we just used any standard routines that were available at the beamline, so then you need to find out what the beamline actually does to the data uh, to find out whether their data is trustworthy or not. Um, there are, however, also examples of people who've done it very, very diligently, taking care of a lot of different effects, such as, uh, well, not just background scattering, uh, but also absorption correction, geometric corrections, uh, angular, taking care of the angular variation. Uh, I think that's the self-absorption correction, um, followed by the removal of the Com Compton or incoherent scattering, which is a very, very complete way of, uh, of subtracting this. Um, one fairly complete example of this is uh, that from Dreis in 2006 published a, an equation for doing background subtractions and correcting for things like um, the diameter of your, uh, the uh, thickness of your sample uh, and the transmission factors which combined with, a, with an absolute scaling factor should get you to absolute units. So a lot of different things. Lots of different possible ways of doing your data corrections. So which one of these are right? Uh, which one is right for you? That of course depends on which assumptions were made for each one of these options. Um, you need to know uh, for many of these corrections what is actually important for you. Uh, and you'll find out that, uh, that this, is, this can be a rather big mess if you're trying to find out what uh, you have to do now. Um, so I come from a time where we ended up with uh, 600 gigabytes of TIFF images from the Swiss light source um, and, uh, and the message saying good luck. We um, then had to figure out all the data corrections ourselves and then we had to find out what was important for us. Um, this is fortunately no longer necessary. So the question arose, uh, can we, can't we just do everything? So I wrote a paper finding out what everything really would be. Uh, so it's about, in this paper it's 21 corrections, but in the next paper we uh, found a couple more exotic corrections that we could do. So yes, you can do, the, you can do all of them. And you can do it just right and do, do it once for, as far as we know, uh, uh, it's a universal data correction, so it should apply to all samples and all beamlines. Of course, um, it depends a little bit on the quality of your beamline. If you have a lot of scattering coming from before your sample environment, uh, you, this may not be complete enough for you. But, so if you have really bad instrumentation, then this might not work. But for, for good instrumentation, we found that this pretty much uh, works as advertised. And we can automate this. So we don't have to think about it much anymore, and neither should you. Um, for everybody here, uh, for all of the participants for whom we've measured data, the data has already been corrected by us uh, because we believe this to be a task of the beamline manager or the instrument scientist um, to give you your data in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a format which is most useful for you. So, I can show a brief demo about how this works. Um, and then, for that, I need to hope that I actually have done started, because that can take a while to start. No. But I can. <laughs> All right. So, just like Tim has shown you, uh, this you can actually download from a website called dawnsci.org. So, dawnsci.org. Um, there you'll find the latest version, which is also what we're using. 
Um, and unlike Tim, I will not use that file browser that he had, but I will just drag in things from, from my own file browser. So you can use a window, Windows file browser or a Mac file browser to find your um, data files and drag them into the Windows. So here we have Dawn. Um, I'll show you that processing pipeline uh, briefly again. And I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, don't worry. Uh, but what I will do is I will load in uh, some of the data files that we've collected for the mouse. So that includes a uh, number 40, I just need to check, 46. Um, I don't exactly remember what this sample was. That's my sample. Oh, that's Glenn's sample. It's a, it's a ZIF8 sample. Um, so when you drag a file into the data slice view, it asks you which data set do you want to load. And as you know, in our Nexus file, we store an enormous amount of data. Um, however, entry one instrument detector data is, is, a good, uh, is a good start for you. So we load that, we have an input and nothing in the output because our pipeline is empty. Now, as Tim said, it can be super tedious to fill in all the data correction steps for this, but um, one of the things we can do is we can take a file which has already been processed um, at, a, at a previous date and just drag that pro processed file in, into your pipeline. And there we go. And that then populates the pipeline with these steps as you had used them in, 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 your previous, uh, in your previous correction. So even if you forget what you did to correct one of your previous data files, you can find that out later on. And if you click on one of these steps, the output window shows you the state of your data at that particular step. So I can now step through my corrections and see what every correction does. And this is particularly handy when one of the corrections um, uh, doesn't work. You can find out which correction gives you a problem. Um, however, in this case, I know it works. So I, after all of these correction steps, um, we can do an azimuthal integration. Uh, to average the data and reduce the data to one-dimensional data. This does take a moment over here, um, but eventually we end up with data. And as, as we press X and Y, you can change between logarithmic and linear scales. Um, we, can, we can then do some final steps like remove NANs, uh, calculate some errors in Q, um, and maybe export as... Uh, as an access file, an ex Kansas or text file, um, just in addition to this processed uh, Nexus file. So this is this is just a bonus uh, a bonus export which which you can do. All right. So that's really how simple it should be. And uh, given all the metadata that is in our uh, that is in our data sets, you don't actually need to change the values in any of these corrections. So. Uh, for example, when we divide by the um, by the thickness of the sample, I think this is all right. Then um, da, 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 model divide. Yes, we are actually dividing, uh, as is shown over here, with metadata that is stored in the same file. So we have the thickness stored in in our measurement file, and we just divide by that value. Um, there was one more thing that I wanted to say about this. Oh yes, um, the reason we're doing all of the corrections in 2D and, and only at the very end do the azimuthal integration is because if you have anisotropic effects, anisotropic backgrounds, um, these subtract better in 2D or these are better for your uncertainties if you subtract them in 2D and then azimuthally integrate rather than first azimuthally integrate and then subtract. This also means that if you have anisotropic scattering samples, you just leave out the azimuthal integration step and you've got nice, corrected, two-dimensional data files. All right, back to my presentation. Um, yep, okay, good. Um, so for these data corrections to work, there are some requirements. First of all, you need to store all your metadata, but the second and perhaps most important step in getting well-corrected data is to select a correct background. And Tim already mentioned this. 
a little bit. So if you have a simple sample, a sample of dilute um, analyte in a, in a particular solvent, what you would need to subtract is everything except the thing you're interested in. So in this case, um, the solvent in its container, in the same container ideally. So we have flow-through containers so that we can always subtract exactly the container plus solvent um, compared to the container plus solvent plus analyte. So these data corrections which are in the paper um, are, uh, have as the first two columns uh, essentially this, where we subtract our cell and dispersant uh, from our analyte in a cell and dispersant. This works for dilute samples. But if you have a concentrated sample, uh, then you find that, if, that you need to do things a little bit more, in a little bit more complicated way. Because um, what you now need to do is you need to separate your container signal from your solvent signal um, and subtract only that much solvent as is actually in your sample with your analyte. Uh, so you need to um, compensate for, for, for this displaced volume correction. So that's also what Tim talked about. And that's why the full correction sequence actually looks like this where first we get a very uh, clean signal of our dispersant in the cell and then we subtract that dispersant after, a, um, after a, a displaced volume correction from the analyte in dispersant in cell. Um, in our paper we have given you a little, uh, a little handy sheet or table, table one, where um, we indicate what you might use as a background in your different samples, uh, for your different samples. So we've divided this into particular sections. A section with solids, uh, if you're measuring solid samples. A, measure, a section with powders. Um, so we measure a surprising amount of powder samples. We put this between sticky tape, uh, sticky tape usually. The um, Scotch uh, magic tape is, is particularly good for this. Uh, we have liquids and liquid dispersions and, of course, we have gases. Well, there have been some people who measured uh, soot particles in flames. Um, so this is, uh, this is um, a sample where you've dispersed your analyte in a, in a gaseous uh, uh, medium. So, question remains, what doesn't it do? Well, there's a couple of things that it doesn't do for good reason. So, it doesn't do a correction for beam smearing. So, in our data corrections, we don't correct the data for beam smearing because that's a mathematically complex and risky uh, thing to do in your data. What you can do is, you, if you know what your beam shape is, you can smear your model. And that is a very straightforward procedure. So when you want to bring your model closer to your data, you, do, you apply the beam smearing correction there. You also want to do the multiple scattering correction in your model because that's where you can find out, that's where you can exactly calculate how much multiple scattering you would have. Whereas correcting your data for, for this quantity would be, again, risky. Uh, same with multiple diffraction. The Lorentz correction is not done. So this is a correction which can be done to XRD patterns to bring your, your, um, uh, uh, the peaks from your crystalline material, um, to correct the peaks from, for, from your crystalline material for the loss in efficiency. Um, of the crystalline reflection principle. However, this should only be done to the X-ray diffraction peaks and not to the small angle scattering signals. So um, when you do a Lorentz correction, if you do it in your model, you can apply it only to those diffraction, uh, diffraction peaks, um, leaving the small angle scattering, the rest of your model, uh, alone. Um, we would also like to add to the data correction methods an automatic X-ray attenuation coefficient calculation. So if you have metadata in your uh, data file which has the sample composition and the density in it, we can calculate the uh, attenuation co um, uh, coefficient and thereby get you a, um, an effective thickness of your sample automatically. Now we do this by hand, but hopefully we can do this automatically and maybe calculate the scattering power of your analyte uh, at the same time so that when you load this in your, in your analysis um, uh, program that you don't need to do this by hand. Um, we'd like to subtract Compton uh, or incoherent uh, scattering backgrounds. This is in X-ray scattering, not a big uh, contribution. 
much bigger in neutron scattering. Um, however, I've been told that this is a very, very complex topic, so I will investigate it a bit further and find out whether this can actually be done. Um, and yes, as I said, we want to do the automatic thickness calculation. And hopefully, we can add to this a step which would flag potential problems. So if, for example, you're, uh, you're doing a whole range of measurements during a beam time or, 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 or in a series of experiments, you can automatically flag whether the data is uh, suspect for multiple scattering uh, contributions. These are, this is a complication to your scattering which you can avoid by having thinner samples. You can also try and um, flag things like uh, too low or too high transmission factors, which means you have either too much or too little sample in the beam, uh, which, could, um, which could be improved and thereby improving the quality of your data. So, what, are, what else does it need? It needs the methodology in place to uh, measure the metadata required for your samples. So, um, I will not show the Nexus structure because we've already seen this yesterday and we've already seen the kind of metadata which is stored in there. But that also needs, means you need to organize your, uh, your data collection strategy so that you can do all of these things. So what we do, as you have found out, whenever you, come, whenever you come to us, we will ask you to fill in one of these proposal sheets. And that is true for everybody. Um, <laughs> Glenn knows what I'm talking about. Um, then we take this information and perhaps in discussion with you, we then define the measurement conditions and we fill in our electronic logbook. Now this electronic logbook is an Excel sheet where every line is a series of measurements in one configuration. Um, this logbook is not there just for show. Uh, it is a crucial component because after that we create, we use the logbook to create a measurement script. So we automatically read the last few lines out of the uh, Excel logbook and convert that into a measurement script. And this script takes care of doing all the necessary extra measurements. So it measures uh, your beam profile for every sample, it measures your beam position, your beam flux, your transmission factor, and it sets a couple of additional things uh, before actually uh, starting the actual measurement. Now the actual measurement, we don't need to be there. This is usually done overnight or over the weekend, sometimes also over holidays, depending on how many samples uh, we can load up at once. Um, we create, that creates a number of files, a number of Nexus files and some text files. We collect all of the files and using another Python script, we do a Nexus to Nexus conversion to make a Nexus file which, uh, which contains more information than what we initially get out of the instrument. We feed in some information from the electronic logbook and we're planning to feed in additional information from the sample proposal sheet, in particular on the sample composition and the density. We then do the uh, data corrections in Dawn. This is at the moment uh, mostly automatic. You load your files, you press go and it runs. Uh, and then you can do your anal analysis. Now, there's a lot of work being done here and uh, part of this work we're now storing inside a database. And this is, uh, sorry, this is the SciCat database. It's a measurement catalog which is under development at the moment at the European Spallation Source in Sweden. Um, where uh, you can store your raw data files in there and your corrected data files in there, uh, linked to the raw data files. And also any analysis that you might have, you might uh, store that in the SciCat database as well. So if you then find a problem with a series of measurements, you can find out which measurements were affected, which analyses might have been affected by that. And basically you have the ability to find your measurements again, even years after your experiment. So we're using SciCat at the moment. It's, we've stored, I think, more than 5,000 uh, uh, data sets in there at the moment. So for us, it's running quite well and automatically. <laughs> Very important. All right. Some of the results that we got for this, uh, for our data corrections, well, you guys have also supplied us with an enormous amount of different samples. Um, your samples might not be in here. This is a list from, uh, from a couple of months ago. Uh, there are a great many different types of samples that have come across our desk. And this is interesting for us because it allows us to test whether this methodology and whether the data corrections work 
uh, for uh, is, is really as universal as we think it is. So far, whenever there have been problems in data corrections, we have been able to trace this back to problems in the metadata, so pin diodes that have not worked properly or uh, missing metadata, um, or human error is also quite common. But since we have the metadata, we can find out what the problem was. One example is that of background subtraction. This uh, is using a sample that came to us uh, from Wageningen University, from Vittorio Sagiomo. He had created a, um, a gold nanoparticle dispersion in a, in a PVA plastic, so that you can print it with a 3D printer. Of course, for that we needed to subtract the clean PVA without the nanoparticles. Um, here's the signal of the gold nanoparticles in PVA. Uh, that of the clean PVA is shown here. You subtract the two, and it's a pretty good subtraction. All right, it's not perfect. You see at a very high Q that there's still a little bit of that diffraction uh, remaining from the PVA. Um, we usually, well, we imagine that we can extract signals which are at least 10% of the background signal uh, cleanly and, um, and without much uncertainty. Um, in this case, it is maybe 2% or something of the, of the background signal. So these are very small differences that we're trying to detect. Um, but in principle, there's nothing stopping you from, from, from doing better as long as you have better metadata. So then you need better data on your beam flux, better data on your transmission factors in particular. Um, we do wide range measurements as well. This is a uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, that we've measured with the detector in different configurations. So here you see all of the data sets individually. We merge the data sets also weighing by the uncertainty so that, um, uh, so that data points with a high uncertainty uh, get weighed less as data points with low uncertainty. Uh, Glenn explained this also uh, yesterday. And then we get a very nice data set with uncertainties uh, which I haven't shown in this example. Um, but yeah, it, uh, this would give you a contigu contiguous data set. Uh, MOFs at multiple energies, this is the sample that Glenn showed yesterday. We have uh, some different effects over here, uh, including that of fluorescence, uh, uh, which, in which introduces a flat background at wide angles. Um, but it shows that with our little lab instrument, we can collect almost four decades in Q, which gives you four decades in uh, size information to fit. What you now really need is a fitting strategy that allows you to fit over these multiple length scales. Um, and that would, be a, that would be a really nice next step. Um, just to indicate, uh, yes, we also do the background subtraction on the wide angle data. So um, in this case, we subtract a tape background from our uh, ZIF-8 signal, uh, both measured on absolute scale, and when you subtract it, it doesn't show up as a big difference, but the subtracted intensity is now on an absolute scale and with uncertainties, um, and this shows just the signal from the ZIF-8, ZIF uh, so you don't need to do, in principle, you don't need to do any of these background subtractions which are, uh, which are perhaps a little, which are perhaps quite common in wide angle diffraction, the rolling ball background subtraction uh, to remove anything but your crystalline material. Sure, you have signal from your uh, amorphous material in here as well, but that's also part of your sample. So maybe should be taken account for. All right, uh, this is the example. This is where things um, can get a little bit more complicated with this background subtraction, but um, this is the one that uh, that Tim showed earlier on. It's a very nice data set um, where after all the data corrections you do end up with a couple of extra rings visible uh, just by virtue of doing the right data corrections. So what are we going to do in the future uh, about data corrections in particular? Uh, Tim and I, as mentioned, are working hard to uh, push for adoption. We're hoping to bring this uh, to bring this data correction to more beam lines, uh, also beam lines of other types. So I'm trying, I've been trying for a very long time to convince uh, uh, some of our colleagues from, um, from a wide angle powder diffraction beam line at Diamond to take up some of these corrections. They say, well, 
first we need a driving force behind this. The users are not asking for it, um, and um, there needs to be an obvious benefit for them. If if all if all they're looking for is 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 two column ASCII data, um, then when we give them one of these Nexus files, they won't know what to do anyway. So that that is one of the that's one of the issues there. Uh, Tim mentioned that we are refactoring this as uh, in pure Python. Um, this is a slightly lengthy pro project, but if you're interested in helping out with this, we're very welcome. Uh, we would very much welcome the help. Um, we would like to push for perfection, so we'd like to include all of the exotic data corrections uh, that we can. Um, and then we need to focus on analysis software as well. So we can do the fanciest data corrections, but if the an analysis software doesn't actually, isn't actually capable of exploiting this um, or using this information, then um, it may not be so necessary after all. So if we scale our intensities to absolute units and you go to a wide angle diffraction uh, fitting program and then you need to rescale your intensity to a maximum of 100 because the Fortran program uh, like to have it that way, um, then you've lost essential, uh, you've lost potentially useful information. Um, so we're working on uh, on a couple of software packages at the moment in the hopes that we can address some of these uh, analysis software issues. And then it's time to get on with life. Um, so now that the data corrections are in place, we're working on uh, refining the methodology, and then we can hopefully. Uh, use all of this to, to give you better data and to help you um, uh, to understand your materials better. So thank you very much for your attention and thanks to everybody who's been very helpful um, during my career. Thank you very much. <laughs>